pain and in the rain. We don't speak like that. We say pain and rain. Okay, are you ready? Yep. How privileged are we today, everyone, you gigglers down the front in, in particular, that in amongst us, you've, and you've already exper experienced this obviously with Helen, who's left the room, and Cassandra, who shared her energy stuff with us already and has more to share, that we, in amongst us we have some amazing talent and you all have, and I know that you could all stand up here and make a difference to us by presenting what you do. Oh, and Ainsley in the very beginning with her numbers. And with, without any doubt, Lubna is one, I said that right? Yes. Uh, Lubna, Lubna is one that uh, has that amazing talent that she can make a profound difference to you from, I, I sort of think it's exciting because what this gives you is the potential to be excited and happy because you're protected. So, and it's not like you are going to be in a position of where I have been before, where I trademarked a business name and had someone come to me uh, before I trademarked it and had them come to me and say, you can't use that name. So I registered, registered it, I trademarked it, and now my life's exceptionally happy. Happy. So without any further ado, I think we should, I know you're sitting down, but I think you should all get up <laughs> and give Lubna an amazing round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> yay, yay. Oh. Thank you. Oh, he didn't get up. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great. And I'm going to leave this with you guys. Oh, you got yes, yes. Well, guys, thank you so much. And, you know, I hope that you get what you need out of this. But obviously, I'm around for the rest of the week if there's anything else that you need to pick up on. And we'll have time for questions at the end. We've heard so much <coughs> about the sort of triangle of branding, personal company product. And I know that lots of you were brainstorming last night and going through your names. Um, you know, with that process, it's actually quite important to be aware of what you can and can't use up front. Um, very early on in my career, I managed the trademarks portfolio at PricewaterhouseCoopers, as responsible for strategic um, management of their trademarks across Europe. And time and time again, the marketing team would spend days, weeks, months choosing a name, then come along to legal, as they like to call us, rather than give us a name, and then we would have to say, well, actually, a lot of the time, this name is already taken or there are issues with the use. So go back to the drawing board and please involve us earlier on in the process in the future. So it's not just about registration. It's about having a much wider awareness over what you can and can't use. So today's menu of opportunities, um, we'll be looking at the difference between names. And there are all sorts of names. You can have a business name. You can have a domain name. Twitter handles, Pinterest, the list goes on and on. So we're going to look at the difference between just having a name and a trademark, which has a much more special quality to it. Our focus will then be to answer the question of whether you should register your brand name, whether it's for your company, your product, or your personal brand as a trademark. And then we'll also touch on what happens when you go global, because I know we're all aspiring to play a very big game, and that means having a global presence. So let's start off with the different types of name. First of all, we have a company name. Um, and what a company name does is that in most countries, so for example, in the UK, we have Companies House. What's it called in Australia? And what's the actual register the organization called? OK. And in Canada? He's Australian. Okay, well, in, in, in the UK, it's called Companies House. In Little... Okay, so there's always a place that you can go to to see what's been registered. So let's just take a very quick look at um, the UK register. Oh, God, Shane. <laughs> um, so... Oh. Okay, but no, there's a special trick. That's what we wanted to do. So this is what it looks like in the UK, and this is a free search facility. So the minute you think of your name, the first check that you can do is see if, the com if it's been taken. So we had to look actually at um, Sue's name, which is Sage Blue. So if we go into Sage Blue, oops. Oh, 
I'm like the kiss of, I am the kiss of death when it comes to you. I did say that, didn't I? Could you just put in shades blue for me? So what's going to come up in a minute is we'll see a list of companies, and there is only one sage blue in there. But all that gives you, if you have a company name, all it means is that you have that name and no one else can use it. So it's not like a personal name with the Sue's or the Helen's, that you can have several Sue's and Sue's and several Helen's. When you have a company name, that's it. There will just be one sage blue. Someone could come along and register sage blue, spelt B-L-O-O, -O, or derivations. It just protects you from anyone else taking an identical name. Thank you, Jane. So when we press search, da -da, you'll see there we have sage blue. So there is a sage blue event. Is that anything to do with you? Okay, but luckily they're dissolved anyway. So there was at some point a sage blue event. But that's all that that will give you. So that's all I needed to do for <laughs> Thank you. So similarly, with the domain name, so I know you've got sageblue.com, which is your active name, but you've also registered some other domains as well. All that does is that prevents someone else from registering the same domain. Um, it doesn't mean that someone can't take another um, domain name. So if you've got .com, .co, .uk, .org, Someone else will find something else that they need. So there's, you know, .it, .me, there are so many of them. So some organizations and some businesses protectively register as many as they can, but actually it's never ending. So that's a decision to make. If you think that you're protecting your business via company and domain names, the important takeaway is that all it does is it prevents someone from getting an identical name but it's not going to prevent them from getting anything that's similar to it or is another combination of it. If you're looking for exclusivity, what you need to be thinking about is trademarks. So just a little bit about where they come from as we start to explore the quality of a trademark. They actually have really sort of horrible beginnings, the brand. And farmers did that. So that because, you know, sheep jump over fences and things. So originally it was to say, this is my sheep. But it evolved into when that farmer went to the marketplace, a purchaser or a, or a customer could say, okay, I know those are his sheep and he feeds them in the fields with a really delicious grass. So that's going to be the best, best meat. So it became known as a symbol of quality or what we call a badge of origin that says whose goods and services they are. Now in contemporary society, that's falling apart a bit. You know, Prada bags used to mean that as a consumer, you knew that your bag had been designed and stitched by artisans in Italy. But now Prada outsource that all to China, they get their bags made in China, and we know that those same factories then run off loads of rip-offs. So essentially, you can get a bag that's not a Prada bag, that is a Prada. So the whole thing of that quality is falling apart in today's global market. But, tra but traditionally, that is what a trademark denoted, the origin of goods and services. What it's evolved into, though, is to give you a monopoly right to use your brand name in a way that a company or a domain name doesn't give you. But it's not a monopoly right to use that word throughout the language. So who's the band there? Oasis, fantastic. And do people recognize this shop outside of Britain? Outside of the UK? Do we have it in Australia? Okay, so it's sort of like a teenage shop where, you know, teenagers, young adults go and get sort of clothes and jewelry and stuff. And then Oasis, the drink, we have that in the UK. Do the Aussies have that? No, okay. So Oasis does not give you the right as a registered trademark owner to use the word in the whole of the English language but only for certain classes of goods and services. So we've got the band, we've got the drinks, and we've got the shop there. Ta-da! <laughs> so let's just have a look at what that looks like. So this is the UK Intellectual Property Office has a trademark register and it shows all of the registered trademarks effective in the UK. So that means marks that have been registered 
in the UK and also marks that have been rec registered as community trademarks. And I'll talk a little bit later about the difference between UK and community trademarks. So I can search there just the word. <coughs> so the very top bar, search for word, search type similar, and search words that's put in Oasis. Okay, so you can see that there are lots of different marks there. It's got the number down the side, and it's got quite a few oasis is spread, spelt exactly oasis, and it's got a couple that have been registered as an image as well, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But let's just look at a couple of these marks. This one here is for the shop. So it covers... Class two, you can see, so sort of like stuff that you'd have in a teenage shop, so all of the makeup and stuff's in class three, all of the jewelry is in class 14, all of the sort of accessories, whether that's the sort of leather stuff, I mean, I'm sure you can just picture this teenage shop, and then 21, all those sort of knickknacks, like utensils, containers, little bits and pieces, and then their mainstay in Oasis is the clothing in class 25. So for those of you inter interested in merchandise, class 25 is usually that ca is the category that you're interested in. We're going to have a look at all the categories in a minute. And that's owned by Oasis Fashions Limited. Yeah, absolutely. It's the International Classification System, and I've got a link to it coming up in a couple of slides. So yeah, it's, it's international. It's most countries in what we call the civilized world and others. So most of the countries that all of us would be operating in would be covered. I'm not sure if Indonesia is covered by it. Um, it's called the Nice or Nice classification system because it was signed in Nice or Nice. How do you pronounce it? Nice. nice. It's French, that's why I'm looking at Emmanuel. <laughs> so it's Nice, um, and there are different countries that have signed it. So you can go back to the treaty and see who, who signed it. Okay, we won't, we won't look at the Oasis one because it will slow it down, but the Oasis registration for the band includes music, so class nine, which is CDs, and then it also includes performing in broadcasting and in, on the radio, and then it also covers entertainment, which would be the band category. What's not registered is the drinks. So they don't have a registration. There's a separate category for drinks. So the shop and the band both have registrations. The band do not have a class 25 registration, which if you remember was the one for clothing. And that, I don't know for certain because I wasn't involved in the registrations, that is probably because the clothing company got there first. Because usually when bands register, they also register for all of their merchandise. Okay, so we had a look at that. And I showed you the one with the tree, which was the logo, and we'll come back to that. I know that Ainsley is interested in that. So Oasis, we've seen, has got all of these different ones. The shop, the band, the drinks, which is not registered, and we also saw a logo on the register. And the system is called the Nice Classification System. And the link that I've given you is to the UK trademark site. And then it has the full list, which is the same for all the countries that are signatories. So we can have a look there. So we've got one which is chemicals and then paints. You'll have all of these slides, so as, as they are. I'll just scroll through these really quickly and then stop at a couple. So nine, that would be all your CDs, your DVDs. You can see there it's got um, DVDs, digital recordings, computer software. In 
instruments, 16 paper goods. So if you're making written course materials, that would be class 16, or if you had written manuals. So those will all be there. So maybe later in the break, if you want to look and see what classes are relevant to you, you might want to do that with your buddy. Okay, so just as an example here, does everyone know who this is? Casper the Friendly Ghost, or as I came to know him, Casper the Unfriendly Ghost. Um, Casper, because there are videos and DVDs, class nine becomes relevant. When I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers, we had a product that was um, software for accounting called Casper. And I was very surprised one day to get a letter from the head of legal at the comic company that owned Casper, whose name has now escaped me. It's not Harvey, but it doesn't matter what the company, the company is, not Marvel. They wrote in and they said, look, this is, this is infringing. They sent what's called a cease and desist letter, um, which is a really mean sounding letter where they just threaten you and tell you that, you know, we own this trademark, you're infringing our rights, and if you don't stop, then we're going to sue you for trademark infringement. So you must cease and desist using it immediately. So after I'd stopped laughing, <laughs> I, I phoned up the head of legal and we talked it through. Um, because even though they were both technically class nine, marks can coexist. So you can't actually register for everything in the class. You can't just have these blankets. So thinking back to that monopoly right, because it is one of the few monopoly rights that we're allowed to have, um, the registries are very strict and they don't give more of a monopoly right than they have to. So in class nine, you can have software and you can also have entertainment DVDs. So there was a real case there for those to coexist. Unfortunately, quite often, if there's a prior mark, so in this case, the friendly ghost Casper, you sometimes have to negotiate, and it's easier to do that, to get the other owner to agree. Otherwise, you need to go through the process. Um, so even though you might be right, one of the sad <coughs> things about law is it can cost a lot of time, money, and energy to be right. So it's always best to attempt to have an amicable solution first, to speak collaboratively, and attempt to reach a win-win solution. So we had a very, very long discussion with the um, head of legal at the comics, and said, look, you know, it's very unlikely that this accounting software, accounting software is going to have any impact on your selling ghost DVDs for children. Um, you know, we have very different outlets. <laughs> PricewaterhouseCoopers don't market directly to the public in the way that you do. And he was able to see how ridiculous he was being. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of the legal system is set up to be adversarial and lawyers think that they're doing their clients a service by really fighting hard. So always ensure that your lawyer understands what your objectives are. So Casper's just an example of how it can go horribly wrong. So I've just been talking about some of these elements here, that when you have a mark as an owner, don't be like Casper the Friendly Ghost owners. You know, think about your consistency and the impact it's going to have on your brand. That story happened a long, long time ago. I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers just before the year 2000, so it was a very long time ago. And things have changed a lot since then. I mean, we use the internet a lot more. A story like that could now go viral very quickly if people realize how idiotic um, the owners of that prior mark had been. What it also means, though, is that if you have a new name, so in this case, if I hadn't been with PricewaterhouseCoopers but working that it was my own software, I might have thought, you know what, as a, as a solopreneur, as a solopreneur software developer, I'm not prepared to, to fight this. Because the head of legal at the comics company, faced with you know, the head of trademarks for the UK, they get, they're prepared to have that conversation. But if you just pick up the phone, you don't know how to talk to another lawyer, he probably would have just been really horrible. I've no doubt about that. So also think about your own appetite for risk and also how do you want to spend your resources? So if up front you know that there's something that's potentially problematic, there's a weighting that you yourself need to work out. You know, how fixed are you to having that name? And do you actually want to spend your resources moving forward? Okay. So just moving on then to another aspect of trademarks. Does anyone remember Marathon? 
Does anyone, has any, does anyone not remember Marathon or not, has not eaten it? Okay, do you know Snickers? Okay, so in the UK, the origins of this brand and this chocolate bar was England, Ta-da! where we knew it as Marathon. And then, one day we were told it was going to be called Snickers. And I was like, I'm not ever going to uh, eat a chocolate bar called Snickers, because it sounds way too much like Knickers. Um, <laughs> But I did, I did obviously end up eating them. That last, my indignation probably lasted for all of, until they were in the shop. Um, but the reason why it switched to Snickers is when Marathon went to the United States, there was already a chocolate bar called Marathon. So they called it Snickers, and it rolled out in other territories as Snickers. And then eventually, Mars decided, you know what, let's just make it consistent. And the relevance of that is the next thing that we need to know about trademarks, which is that they have geographical limitations. So if you get a registered trademark, it applies country by country by country by country. The exception to that is the community trademark, where you can have one trademark that extends to the whole of the European Union, a CTM. But apart from that, there is that approach where you have to go country by country, which I'm sure you're all sort of thinking expense so it can end up being a very expensive exercise. Just touch on these two symbols. The R in the circle means that you have a registered trademark. So you've applied to register, paid the registration fee, it's gone through the process, and you've been issued with a trademark certificate. Until you actually have a trademark certificate, it's a criminal offense to use the R in a circle. And technically, you can go to prison for that. But I don't think anyone ever has. The TM is an informal symbol. People will use that sometimes when they have a pending trademark application. At other times, they'll use it where they have no intention to register a trademark, but they're using their mark as a trademark, and they don't want others to use it. So I would recommend for all of you, if you're using a name as a brand name, to use the TM, to just add that onto the end. Do you have a question there? Yeah. No, so it's just a point of clarity. You don't actually have to register or be pending to use TM. Absolutely. How cool is that? That's very cool. I did so not TM know. So TM just means that you have an unregistered trademark. So you could have no intent. You could not have any intent. I'm not. I'm going to mix up all my negatives here. So this is not correct grammar, but I'm just not very good at negatives. You could have no intention at all whatsoever <laughs> to register a trademark and use the TM. So if I had a product and I put or a product name and I put TM, but I didn't register it, and then somebody long goes, "Oh, that's not actually registered." They could register, and then that bumps off my. That's a very good question. So, and this is this comes into the whole thing of why you should register. So Craig's just saying that if he is using TM for his unregistered mark and someone else comes along and uses or registers it, what can he do? This is one of the reasons why it helps to have a registered trademark. Um, because essentially, if someone has a registered trademark, they have stronger rights. So what you should be doing as an unregistered trademark owner if you is still keep an eye out to anyone else registering it. And you can subscribe to a service called the Trademark Watch Service, or you can just keep an eye on the register in the way that we looked at, because it shows pending applications. So you could do that yourself. And then if there is a pending application, you have to get in there and object. And your grounds for objecting are that you have what's called prior rights because the trademarks registrar will recognize that there are unregistered trademark rights. Then, though, you would need to go through an amount of process, so you would need to show that you had goodwill in the mark, or what we could call reputation in the mark, and you would need to do that by gathering evidence and showing to the registrar and proving that, that you had that goodwill and that your mark was created before the other person's mark. So as you can see, there's a little bit of an uphill struggle so that's a decision to make at the outset. Do you want to have that comfort, security, and uncertainty of a registered mark? Or are you going to have what I like to call an appetite for risk and think, well, later someone else may come along and use a similar mark? So that's a decision to be made. Cassandra. 
Back in the pre-digital days, um, people would talk about basically you'd have to show evidence of when you started using it and maybe you took the name and you stick it in an envelope in a vault with a newspaper or some sort of stuff. Now these days, I presume your digital footprint yeah. would be your proof for that? Yeah. So you'd need to show your first date of use. There were all sorts of things. You'd have marketing materials that you had, as you say, you'd sent to yourself. But what we're looking for trademarks really, because I think you're slightly talking about copyright as well, because it's relevant there. With trademarks, because it's tied in with goodwill, the best thing to collect as evidence includes things like any press releases, anything external. So collect both of those together. On, on that, I, if someone wants to register a, a trademark, the, the registering office is, is going to, to look if there is any precedent. So if you're already uh, using the brand, usually they shouldn't uh, give away the, the trademark if someone else is using it. Okay, it? so that's a good question. All that the trademark office will do, the patent office, the intellectual property office will do, will look at what is already on their register. So they will just look. So the way that what happens is that if I'm the trademark office, I'll get my big box of applications, I'll look through, I'll say, is this name okay as a trademark? We're going to come to what that means. That would be my first question. Then I would say, and is there an existing mark? But I will only look for existing marks on my own register. You're not I, going to Google or something? I am not going to Google. I don't have the resources to do that, and I'm not taking that responsibility. The opportunity for someone with an unregistered trademark is that there's then a period when I would advertise it. So I'm still the trademark registrar. I've ticked off, yep, okay as a name, yep, okay, nothing else. And then there's a magazine in the UK called the Trademarks Journal. So it then comes out in the Trademarks <laughs> Journal. Um, or you can just check online in the way that I've said. And then there's a period of advertising that's an opportunity for anyone with an unregistered mark or anyone else who objects to a mark to come along and say, actually, this should not be registered. So it's your responsibility. Would someone get me some water? Thanks. If a company is registered, would they always use the R, or is that optional? If a trademark is registered? Yes. Um, that's a decision that they make. It's op it is optional. So like that logo behind you, Entrepreneurs Institute, that could be registered or it could mm. not, or we wouldn't I know. had to look on the UK Trademarks Register and Entrepreneurs Institute isn't a registered trademark. Mm. If it was a registered trademark, then they could use the R. It's a good idea to do it because once you have a trademark, you have to use it, use it as a trademark. And one of the ways that you indicate that you're using it as a trademark is with that R. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How much does it cost to register? Okay. So costs vary. In the UK, we only really know what it is in the UK. In the UK, the fee for one class is £225. If you add in additional classes with that application, they're 50 pounds, um, I believe. I mean, you can check the exact thing online, but um, when I last checked, it was 225 pounds for one class and then 50 pounds for each additional class in the same application. So if you applied and then thought, thought later, you know what, I really should have included the hats as well, then you have to register again. And when you register, you can either do it yourself or you can use a trademark agent. Some people go a really roundabout way and they'll use a lawyer and a trademark agent. I would never do that. I would also always say, for those of you in the UK, go directly to a trademark agent. And um, if anyone wants a recommendation, I can give you the name of the trademark agent that I always use. Um, it's not something a lot of lawyers do themselves because it's not cost effective. Trademarks agents' fees, if it's a straightforward application in the UK, would be £250 in that region for one class and then a bit extra. So they more or less track 
the fees. And uh, for a lawyer, you'd be paying a lot more than that. So to clarify, you could put a pending trademark, which would cost you nothing. Is that right? My understanding, because I don't do the actual nitty-gritty admin part of putting in applications, my understanding is that the fee goes in when you make the application. So in the, pen, in the pending stage, I'm just, I'm just wondering about why it is so many people have that TM. People have the TM because when you, so if I made an application today, it could take, at le it will take at least eight to 12 months for the application to go through. It can take longer. It can take years. So you can use the TM from the date you apply. You can use the TM, I can use the TM from today. If I decide I'm gonna have a trademark, I can use TM right away until the point I even decide to apply to register it. You can, so, okay, this is a time cycle. Aha, so, so, what's... So I could put TM against one of my training courses right now. Right now. Okay, that's, 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 that's the bit, I, it was where the they stopped. The important thing, because I'm not sure if you were in the room then, and I don't want my buddy to go to jail, the important thing is you cannot use the R until you have a trademark certificate, okay? Yeah, That's the I important that. part to thank remember. You. And I know as my buddy you would look after me wonderfully, thank you. <laughs> okay, so just looking then at what trademark infringement is. Where you have a registered trademark, if someone else comes along and uses the ident an identical or a similar trademark for identical or similar goods or services, there will be, on the face of it, trademark infringement. So as we saw earlier, Oasis, no problem at all if I decided to have an Oasis training course, because there weren't any registrations in those classes. But I can't start using Oasis for a label. I would be infringing someone else's mark. In that case, they can send a cease and desist letter Sorry, Lebanon, just a, another point of clarity. So, an organization has a, um, a trademark, a TM, so they're not registered and they're not planning to register. So, Sage Blue TM, yep. Um, can I send a cease and desist letter to Barry that set up a Sage Blue? It depends what he's doing. So if he's in the same sector, and I'm not registered, but I've just TM'd it, have I got a right to send him a cease and desist letter? No. no. Okay, so the whole thing with threatening infringement proceedings is that you have to have an absolute right to do that. So it only applies where you have a registered trademark. We're going to come on in a minute to, happen, to what happens when you have an unregistered trademark. But not only that, there's, I'll come to you in just a second. There's also a wider branding piece to it. Do you want to come out or come across as being a, a jackass mm -hmm. and send out cease and desist letter? Is this a time thing? Well, I just have to look at the information. What time do I have until? Okay, I'm keeping a grip on it because yeah. most of the questions, we'll speed through some of the other yeah. slides because we've covered them already. Okay. If we get to about 5-2 and we're lagging, then I'll just have to say, Ben, no questions. But I think in some ways it's better if we answer them as, they, as we go along. Um, so the, the thing is, don't be an idiot. And there's an example. <laughs> there is an example of the most beautiful cease and desist letter there, um, which I won't go into now. Um, but basically, there was a writer, and on the cover of his book, he had taken the Jack Daniels label and put that on the cover of his book. So traditionally, what Jack Daniels' lawyer would have done was like, oh my God, and been really exciting, excited because something had happened, and phoned the client and said, oh, I'm going to send out a cease and desist letter and charge you millions, no doubt. Well, not millions, but charge you a lot. Well, it would be millions if it was in Bali, obviously. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Instead, they wrote the most beautiful letter, just saying, you know, we're so flattered that you've chosen to use our label. You obviously appreciate the quality of Jack Daniels, but actually, you know what? This is our trademark. 
And if we don't protect our trademarks and we don't control how they're used, we're going to lose our trademarks. So would you mind terribly you know, changing the cover of your book and we'll pay you to redesign your book cover. That mark, that letter, that's actually the writer's website. And um, there's a link so you can actually see the letter. It is all over the web. Forbes wrote about it. Business Week wrote about it. Jack Daniels could have stopped him, slammed him down. But instead, they created so much goodwill. And people are still talking about this. So there's a different approach. Emmanuel, did you have a question? If you want to enforce it to someone where you're using it, can you enforce to someone where we're using it before, but we didn't register? Let's say Sage Blue, uh, if Sue is starting and register like a proper registration, Sage Blue, can she go after people we're using before and say, okay, you infringe my copyright, can you just remove? Infringe thing? her trademark. My she trademark, can, yeah. She can, but then she would have that battle in that they would say, well, actually, I've got a defense. I had an unregistered trademark. So it's not really enforceable in a way. Um, it it's is. just intimidation, but she, don't, she can't really enforce it immediately. Do you know, it's so hypothetical. I think, OK, so basically, Sue has had Sage Blue. Let's say we've all been using Sage Blue for different things for years. Sue then registers her, hers, and then she wants to bring an action against us. She'll have to show a different sort of action. And oh no, she wouldn't. That would be registered trademark. OK, so she ha now has a registered trademark, and she attempts to stop us. Each of us would have a defense and say, I have prior rights in the mark. She may be successful against some of us. She may not be successful against yeah. others. It will all depend, because she'll also have prior use. But you won't give any guarantee. If there's, there's prior not use, a guarantee. registered trademark don't give any guarantees in no. a monopoly, in a way. No. Let's take this discussion outside because it doesn't have an answer and it's a very, it doesn't have an end point that's going to just take up the rest of the time. But we can talk about that later. Um, unregistered trademark. So do we all know the GIF lemon? Okay, so the GIF lemon, I've written down the year because I don't like numbers. GIF lemon, 1990. So the GIF lemon had been on our market since 1956. Since 1956, sold in the shops. In 1990, an American company came along and also started selling lemon juice and lemons. Reckitt and Coleman, the owner of GIF as we know it, were enraged, understandably, and took them to court. It went all the way to the House of Lords, which is the highest court in the, in the United Kingdom, now called the Supreme Court, but then it was called the House of Lords. And the House of Lords said, because it was an unregistered trademark, it set out when someone would be successful with an unregistered trademark from preventing someone else from using an unregistered trademark. So just remember, with a registered one, all you need to do is say, I have a trademark certificate, and then the other person has to show why they might still be able to use their mark. But with an unregistered trademark, the owner has to show that they have the reputation in the mark that the other person is misrepresenting to the public that they also have a reputation in the mark that is damaging to the first. So the three elements, goodwill, misrepresentation, and damaging. And with GIF, they said all of those elements were present. So you can see that the hurdles for showing that you have rights in the unregistered mark are much higher. Any idea, do you, any idea why GIF, if they've been using the mark since 1956, how did this happen in 1990? Does anyone have an idea of why GIF Lemon didn't have a registration for lemon juice? That's completely different. Those are household products. Okay, so the reason why is it relates to eligibility for a trademark. The first the first requirement, your mark must be distinctive for the goods and services that you provide. So if I have a lemon, I can't just call it lemon. <laughs> so with GIF, they couldn't register the shape of a lemon and the appearance of a lemon for a lemon. So they weren't able to register it. 
We've already mentioned it can't be similar or identical to anything else on the register, and it also can't be deceptive, unlawful, or immoral. Now, Ainsley had asked me a question about whether she could register weapons of mass destruction. Reduction. Reduction. And whether there was an issue with BAS. So I looked that up just in the UK because that's easier for me to navigate. So in, under UK law, you couldn't register it probably as a company name because there are restrictions against using those for company names. As far as I can tell, it's fine for trademarks because they have different rules. So there is actually a company in the UK that's called VAT, or uh, not a company, a trademark called VATMAN, which is VAT accounting software. So you probably, I mean, you'd obviously have to check, can apply to register weapons of mass reduction in Australia, because laws tend to be similar, but aren't always exactly the same. So just looking at that immor immorality, people are aware of this from the UK, French connection. So this mark, everyone was terribly excited by it because it looks a little bit by swear word. It looks a little bit like a swear word. But one man, actually, when it was advertised, because you remember you've got that period where you can object, he was just Joe Average Businessman, and he objected to the trademark saying it was immoral because people could misread it for the swear word and be a bit upset. So poor old French Connection had to fight and fight and fight it, but they were successful in the end. So French Connection is able to put this on all their shops and labels. So what can you register? I mentioned logos earlier. You can register a word, you can register a sound, you can register colors, and you can register logos. Logos are sometimes used as a saving grace. So especially in the corporate world, for example, we have so many three-letter acronyms. And if you searched on the search, you'll see there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Because the registrar will go along and say, well, I've already got this, no. Corporates then attempt to do something to ensure that they've got something on the register. There's a question over how much value it has, because what you can do then is have a logo. So if it was PricewaterhouseCoopers, so PwC, we couldn't register that, so it had its logo type. But all that protects you for is that logo type. Anyone else could come along with PwC, and register it with a different logo mark, mark, with a different logo. So it gives you kind of limited um, protection, but what it can do is it can put other people off. So if I went along and I was like, well, I can do it, but actually I don't want, I want something that's unique. So it gives you that deterrent effect, but it's a mindset effect rather than a legal effect. So that's the limitation of it. But the other thing to bear in mind about logos is that most logos will also be an artistic work, so they'll also have protection as copyright. We won't go into copyright, we can always talk about that later, but there is that added level of protection. So why do we do searches? We've, we've already touched on most of this. To see if the mark's available. Um, also, when we look at existing marks, we need to think about, well, are they going to be infringing and are we just going to be actually wrong? Um, even if they're not infringing, is there that potential hassle factor waiting for us? Casper, the unfriendly ghost, you know, is he going to come out of the shadows? But also, even if we know we can use it and there's not going to be a problem, what about our uniqueness and the impact and the associations? So let's say there was a mark that we could use in our category, but it was also being used for a porn site, or it was being used for hamburgers and we were vegetarian. Do we want those associations? That's just references for you. So I showed you the UK site. If you want to search the European register, the Australian one I had to go at, I didn't find it user-friendly at all. It kept telling me I was doing things wrong and the US site, which is also quite easy to use. So going global, we've already talked about this as well, country by country. It is very expensive, but one thing that you can do if you're planning and sort of planning how you're going to spend your budget is once you've got your first application in, so say, for example, I decided to, or genderomics, I did look up genderomics and it's available, so no one's got anything similar. So say you're going to go global with genderomics. 
You could apply in the UK because that's your country of origin, and then gradually when you're going global, you have to think strategically and actually think, well, what do I mean by global? Because it's so expensive. Where am I actually going to have a presence? Also, when you're thinking the presence is that you have to have an intent to use. So in most countries, if you're just attempting to save words, that will be unlawful. When you sign a trademark application in the US, you're signing a declaration that you have a real intent to use that mark within five years. If that's not true, it's perjury. So once again, prison. So, <laughs> so make sure you have an intent to use. Skipping back a bit, if you've got that first application in, if you apply to what you call the Paris Convention countries, so again, those most of the countries that we call civilized, um, if you apply within six months, those applications will all be dated up to that same date. Now, this feeds back into your question though, about registration and not registration. When you've got a battle between two trademarks, the person who used theirs first is the one who, who gets the trump, who has the trump card. But if I had a date of prior use, so I registered in the UK, and then three months later, I'm still within my six month period, three months later, someone in France comes along and starts using it, even if they've used it, and technically I've got a three month lag, I'm still considered as having that earlier date. Okay. So that feeds into your registration strategy. And then just looking at the other global aspect is, you know, we've got the, our beautiful world that someone's divided up and then the, work, the web has brought us back together again. Um, so how, do we, how does this impact on naming? How it really impacts is that we have sort of the territorial nature of trademarks and then we have the web. So what happens if I want to register my website, which, you know, I have sixminutebytes.com, although apparently it's not a very good branding name, um, if someone else has trademarks in different countries, what, what difference does that have? Basically, you have to look at it country by country, and it is a bit artificial, but we have to separate out the existence of the web from our right to use a trademark. So if we are in the UK and you have genderomics and someone else has got genderomics.com, you can only really start objecting to them if they're in the UK, and then you look at what they're doing in the UK. But otherwise, websites, we don't really have that many rights over. So, Lubna, does it really mean that uh, I can register any domain which is available, even though it is trademarked, registered, copied? Basically, there is all kind of a protection? You can. So basically, what, that's absolutely right. We can register whatever domain names we want, but what, where the kick in comes in is when we attempt to use them. So even though I could register genderomics.org, I don't know if you've got that one, or .biz, I couldn't then go, there are two things I can't do. The first thing that I can't do is go into the UK and then start trading. The other thing that I can't do is use my domain name in bad faith. And what that means is, if I've registered it because I want to start charging Sue or say, hey Sue, I've got this, this domain name, buy it from me, that would be bad faith. And if there's a question of bad faith, the organization to go to is Nominet. So it's called cyber squatting, and Nominet have a process for cyber squatting. So, but otherwise you're free to register whatever domain names you want, but what you can't do is start using it in a way that infringes on someone's trademark rights or attempt to make money from them. Because that's seen as being bad faith. So you were all familiar with organizations that register trademarks. Um, so it's not an offense for someone to warehouse them and wait for you to come to them, but they can't start going out and saying, buy it from me. Just wanted to give you an example of how the things work, of how things work together, though, and just an example of Facebook. One of my dear friends years ago, actually, was, um, who we were both at an angel workshop together, she went on to be an angel practitioner. About two weeks after we did a course with Doreen Virtue, she set up a page called Angelic Inspirations, 
without any marketing, without kind of hassling anyone or sending out those sponsored ad ads, she got over 11,000 people joining her Facebook page within about five weeks. After about this, the, coming up to this, just by posting from her heart and really beautiful stuff, it just exploded. Six weeks into it, though, um, an American person wrote to her and sent her a cease and desist letter saying, I have a registered trademark for angelic inspirations and you must cease and desist and blah, blah, blah. What we've been talking about earlier, I was saying that territorial thing. So we have American trademark, a UK person with her Facebook page. Had that been a website, she would have been all right. But Facebook's terms and conditions at the time, I don't know what they say now because I don't usually bother to read them. Facebook's terms and conditions at the time said that if someone had a national registered trademark, that would trump someone's Facebook page. So she had to stop using it. 11, over 11,000. It's just awful. So very quickly then, these are the areas that we've covered. So the difference between the names, the main thing, the registration of your brand name as a trademark, and the things for you to think about are availability and how much risk you want to take based on everything we've talked about. Going global, we've touched on strategy and awareness. So I've also talked about this. If you want to have further advice, in the UK, either lawyers or trademark attorneys will help you further. If you wanted to register, you can attempt to do it yourself, or you may want to use a trademark attorney. In my view, the costs are so, are so relatively low that I would just use a trademark attorney, especially as you have to pay the fees anyway, so it's not that much more. And practical steps, always check for availability. So check companies, house, domain names, trademark registers. With unregistered marks, if you're using an unregistered mark, yes, you can use a TM, but be vigilant. You don't want someone else to sneak in with a registration, so just check into your national registry, you know, diarize that. If you've got registered marks, police your marks, keep an eye out for anyone else who's using something registered or unregistered and stop them. Oh, whoops, did that too soon. And be reasonable. Just remember, if you're going to go around shouting at people, you're going to damage your brand, unless your brand is around, um, you know, being a thug or anything. <laughs> and um, at exactly 10 o'clock, <laughs> we have got to the end. <laughs> I won't take any more questions because it is 10 o'clock, but um, I will be around um, for the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.